Here they come. Here is the pelvis. This is a kneecap. Part of the pump. This is great stuff. What can a pile of 10,000-year-old bison bones reveal about some of America's earliest people? So we're starting to get social interaction, social organization. This is exactly the type of tool we're finding. Our people did this and it's like natural for us. Time Team has three days to find out. Now they're looking kind of dangerous. Joe Watkins, Alan Macca, Meg Waters, Chelsea Rose, Jeff Brown, and me, Justine Shapiro. Together, we are Time Team America. For three days, we bring together the top scientists with the newest technologies to help solve America's greatest archaeological mysteries. This program was made possible in part by a major grant from the National Science Foundation, where discoveries begin. It's not easy to get to Badger Hole in Northwest Oklahoma, we're miles from the nearest town, which is one reason the bones of Badger Hole went unnoticed for so long. But Dr. Liebemann's discovery of a massive bison killing field caught Time Team's attention because it's over 10,000 years old. This could be one of the largest and oldest bison killing fields ever found. These bison were massive, dangerous animals with horns out to here and the people stalked them on foot because there were no horses here at the time and the bow and arrow hadn't even been invented yet. So who were these people, these Paleo-Indians, some of the earliest inhabitants to North America, who, against all odds, figured out how to kill these powerful animals? How did they do it? And can we get these answers from the pile of bones buried here? To get to the bottom of this mystery, Time Team is here with a team of scientists and the most advanced tools archaeology has to offer. But is three days enough time to uncover the secrets of a people that archaeologists know almost nothing about? <laughs> it's going to be a good one. The bones Lee discovered come from a now-extinct prehistoric bison species called Bison antiquus that was 25% larger than the bison we know today. Their horns stretched four feet from tip to tip. Killing even one would be hard, but Lee thinks dozens were killed here at Badger Hole in an ancient arroyo, or gully, that used to look something like this. That arroyo had an open mouth on one end, and it's here where Lee found his first badger hole bones. The rest of the arroyo is filled in with 10,000 years of blown-in soil. Lee wants us to dig until we find the end, or what's called the nick point of the arroyo. That's where he thinks we'll find even more bones and more evidence that could tell us how this great hunt went down. To see that buried arroyo today takes some imagination and a lot of high-tech wizardry. Shot! 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 Again! We're going to be at geophone number six. Meg Waters, our geophysical science expert, calls in some time team muscle to help with a remote sensing technique called seismic tomography. Oh, yeah. Nope. Ah. Shot! He's so tall, that's the... Nope. <laughs> Each shot sends sound waves into the earth, which bounce off of different soil layers. Okay, so now we need to pick up the cable and move it over. What you do is you connect the clip. Combine this with a technique called resistivity, and we should get a better idea of where to start looking for whatever's hiding in this buried, ancient arroyo. 
We have a perfect morning to start our first day of digging. Under the wary eye of some resident cattle, Lee's crews head down to a partially excavated bone bed while we wait to see if Meg found our hidden arroyo. How are we doing? I'm good. How are you guys? All right. Are you ready to blind us with science, Meg? <laughs> yes, I am. Yes, I am. My goal yesterday with the geophysics team was to try to find the nick point so that we can identify maybe where the head of the gully is. What we're looking at is a vertical slice into the ground, like layer cake. Look at that drop off. This is the bottom of the ancient gully coming along right here. This one, however, right here, this is definitely one of the nick points that I'd this want to investigate. This would be the closest yeah, one absolutely. to the bone bed, yeah. So you've identified two potential nick points Absolutely. Here? Do you have a suspicion, Lee, of which of those nick points is, is the one that's most important? Oh, absolutely. It's going to be one of those two. <laughs> <laughs> we want to find that nick point because the nick point is basically a dead end, and we think that's where most of the bison herd may have piled up. But we need to test how deeply those animals are buried before we dig. This is just through this top sand, so yeah. this is... Like butter. This coring machine literally drills down through time. Radiocarbon dating of the soil in the bone bed at the opening of this arroyo tells us that it's about 10,000 years old. So we're just looking for soil that matches it. Right. So what does this say to you, Lee? You know this dirt pretty well? We got a little ways to go. Okay. Hook it up, Steve. After 15 minutes, we hit soil that matches what's in Lee's bone bed, but it's deep. At this point, then, the decision has to be made, is it worth doing another core hole, or do we want to just bring in the backhoe and go ahead and open up? That, that is so easy to identify. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're going to be able to go to that. We're gonna, we can stop at this level and not really run the risk of mm -hmm. tearing up a bone bed. I think mm -hmm. that's yeah. one of the big concerns about using a backhoe. Based on previous tests, we don't expect any bison bones in the thick topsoil, so we feel comfortable using a backhoe to get us quickly down to that 10,000-year-old level. We leave the big dig to a guy known around here as Dozer Dan. Well, you can hear the big machinery. The excavation at Badger Hole is well underway, but there's a site I really want to see. It's just a quarter mile that way, and it's the Cooper site, and that's where this all began. To reconstruct exactly how the Paleo Indians pulled off their great hunt, we need to sew together evidence from all of Lee's digs. And the Cooper site is where Lee made one of the biggest discoveries in Paleo-Indian archaeology. So how much further is it to Cooper? We're here. This is the Cooper site. That's so, it. This, yep, yeah, this hillside 20 years ago is where one of the game wardens contacted me and said, hey, I think there's a place out here you might want to come take a look at. You might be interested in what's there. I go, oh yeah, what you got? And he goes, there's this big pile of bones. They weren't just any bones. When Lee dug into this hillside, he uncovered the largest collection of Folsom period bison bones ever found. The evidence had been eroding out of the dirt for decades, but no one had given them much thought. The ranch foreman that had worked on the ranch for quite a few years explained that when he was in high school that the local science teacher came out. At that time, he determined they must have just been cattle bones, just uh, plain old cow bones. Do you think he really thought they were just cattle bones? Uh, I don't know. He, teacher, he right? might have done it in the sake of preservation of the site, uh, definitely. But, uh, you know, the locals from that point on thought, well, it's cow bones, so they didn't mess with them. And, you know, I think it saved the site. It was the scale of this kill that caught Lee's attention. Here were 78 prehistoric bison including many complete skeletons, 
that came from three kills over several years. This was a different kind of hunt. Earlier Paleo-Indians, including the Clovis people who first arrived in the New World around 13,000 years ago, were known mostly as opportunistic hunters who used spears to bring down lone animals. But sometime during the Folsom period, which began around 11,000 years ago, hunting took a great leap forward. The Folsom-style points and tools that Lee found littered among the bones at Cooper mark some of the earliest evidence of a radical new technique in which large numbers of animals were somehow led to a pre-chosen killing ground. But Lee's biggest find was still to come. I was working along this leg bone and there was something underneath it and right there is this bleached white skull with this brilliant red zigzag painted design wow. coming right down its forehead. Right. Every archaeologist's dream. And, you know, What's known as the Cooper Painted Skull is thought to be the oldest painted object in North America. It's now a centerpiece of the Paleo-Indian exhibit at the Sam Noble Oklahoma Museum of Natural History. A replica skull encases the painted fragments. Reassemble the pieces and the skull would have looked something like this. Could it represent some of the first evidence of hunting ritual among Paleo-Indians? And, and we have to consider this more than 10,000 years ago, these animals were massive, much bigger than the ones we see now. And these were the kings and queens of the plains, right? And so, you know, the, the idea of celebrating these things, of hunting them, of bringing them into their lives, of actually consuming them, and making your life out of theirs. I mean, this is a very organic, very complex, you know, kind of thing. So, yeah, I mean, the, the bison were fundamentally important, probably deified. Back at Badger Hole, we're not finding anything like the painted skull. We're halfway through our first day, and we'd settle for just finding some bones. in the center of the earth. Sheesh. So far, we have a really big hole, but no nick point crammed with bison bones. Down at the exposed bone bed at the mouth of the arroyo, Lee students continue the work that he began in 2009. In just this small area, they found bones from nearly a dozen animals. The bones are fragile, the work uncovering them slow and tedious. What happened next caught everyone completely off guard. About a dozen cattle spooked on the open range above where we were working. It's only by chance that Lee's team escaped serious injury. We haven't had this conversation, but I'm the world's first responder. No. Yeah. Right, right down right. into the dick scared the daylight out of me. Yeah, it was like a mini stampede, huh? No, it was. Why do you think they got spooked? I don't know. Some spirit of a bison or something? They, who knows with cattle. Our crews were only a little worse for the wear, but we had to ask, why would a cow jump headlong into a 10-foot pit? Were the badger hole bison driven over cliffs to their deaths, just like this? Lee says no. But to understand why, we need to see how a real bison herd behaves. So we head east to a preserve near Pahuska, Oklahoma, where bison still roam free. You must be Bob. Good morning. Yeah. Good morning. I'm Justine. Bob Hamilton, yeah. Nice to meet you. I'm Joe Watkins, Bob. Joe, how are you? Yeah, welcome to the tall grass. I've never yeah. been this close to a buffalo before. Yeah, they're nice and cuddly. They, they are buffalo, us. right? Even though you call them bison? Well, I mean, if you want to be scientifically correct, you call them bison. Okay. Yeah. True buffalo are like the Asiatic water buffalo. Can we get any closer to the bison? Is well, it safe? this is probably about as close as we should go on foot. They're a little unpredictable and ornery, you know, uh, so we should probably really get in the truck. The Nature Conservancy keeps over 2,500 bison on 150 square miles of native prairie. 
They're technically domestic bison, but the animals look and act every bit as wild as their ancient ancestors. Wow, Perfect. they move fast. Yeah. She just loping Ooh. along. Yeah, yeah. Gosh, that's beautiful. They, they want to okay, ride. now they're looking. Now they're looking kind of dangerous. <laughs> with those horns, mm -hmm. it's really sweet to see how the babies are with their mamas. Like the cows are really protective, aren't they? Well, that's a very strong relationship there. Now you don't want to try to get in between that. These animals are enormous. Some weigh almost 1,800 pounds. These modern species of bison are direct descendants of the ancient bison of Paleolithic times. And just like their ancestors, they stick together for protection. If you had to hunt them on foot, you can see how it would be hard to get close for a kill. So how did early hunters do it? Now, when I came here, I imagined Native Americans on horseback hunting bison with bows and arrows, or like we saw with our cow, maybe driving bison over a cliff. Those were effective and efficient ways of killing bison, but Paleo-Indians had none of the advantages of more recent Native American tribes. It's different. 10,000 years ago, no horses. No horses. Bow and arrow hadn't even been invented yet. Um, so they were doing it on foot, and they spooked them, it may be another three or four days before they could get them positioned to where they could have a successful hunt. If you watch the herd long enough, you can see what might be perceived as a weakness. The herd is actually a lot of small groups moving together, and these small groups follow a leader, usually a mother cow. This herding behavior may have presented our hunters with their opportunity. So you could probably pick out a group follow it for about three days, try to see if you can maybe focus on a group that's near one of the, the arroyos that you want to use as part of your hunting. They actually weren't hunting. They were maneuvering them, right? Because they didn't have bows and arrows. They weren't hunting them. They were kind of leading them to the place where they were then going to kill them. You know, as they say, you can herd bison anywhere they want to go. What would a mistake look like? You know, when you were hunting these bison, the grass would have been, oh, maybe up to here. And so you could be positioning yourself down here, kind of looking around, kind of helping to lead the herd. And if you squat down on a prickly pear or a snake walks by it, you stand up, that action is gonna shock the bison. They're gonna see an interruption of, of the landscape. And so that's likely to get them stampeding. But I think if you can get in there without spooking them, you can control them. If Paleo-Indians could control them, they might slowly separate a small group from the herd and prod it toward a specific arroyo like Badger Hole. It's a good theory, but do the bones provide the evidence we need to prove it? If the answer is in the hidden arroyo, it's still eluding us. So you know how this morning everyone was real optimistic that we were going to find the nick point within a half hour or an hour? and. We got all this big equipment out there to, to look for it, and the day is almost over, and we haven't found what we think is the nick point. So people are a little nervous. We head into the evening, determined to come up with a new plan to get to those buried bison bones by tomorrow. With only two days left, our backhoe trench looks to be a dead end. I mean, this is like 20 feet down. Yeah. Even if we would have found the bone bed, we couldn't access it in the time we have because you'd have to basically excavate off this whole terrace to make right. it safe enough to get in there. Right. But I don't want you to think we didn't find any bones. You found bones? <laughs> yeah. This is horse bone from 100,000 years ago. This is an extinct type of horse that what? used to run wait, around wait, wait, here. Wait, say that again slowly. 100,000 <laughs> yeah. years ago? We're talking about a Pleistocene animal here, something that disappeared tens of thousands of years before modern horses arrived in the New World with Spanish explorers. Yeah. Yes, yes, that looks like uh, inside of a bone, like yeah. a marrow area. 100,000 yeah. years old. <laughs> We're excited about the horse bone, but we came in search of bison, and we need new evidence. With only two days left, it's time for a new plan. The stakes are high because Joe wants to use a backhoe right above Lee's hand-dug bone bed. 
-hmm. We've got a proposition for you. All right. Talking with Dozer Dan this morning, we realized that we might be able to get in here and get some of this top stripped back for you. Would that help you? Do I get a good dramatic pause in here <laughs> while I figure out where I'm going to bury your ass? So long as we can hear you. Lee is protective of his bone bed, but Time Team's plan would uncover more of this killing field. The risk is if Dozer Dan makes a mistake, a mistake that would bury all of Lee's work. Yeah, we hate to spring it on you early, but better early than late, I guess. Better early than than when the dozer's up there working. <laughs> and they go, what the hell? Lee decides it's too risky. What do you think, boss man? We need to find out how wide this arroyo really is. Mm -hmm. But if he can come at it from down here and then dig a trench like we have excavated this mm -hmm. here, that would provide us a view of that face. Mm -hmm. Very similar to how we cut sure. that profile out there at the Cooper site right. so that we could see it. Only it would happen a whole lot quicker with a backhoe than with our crew with the shovel. To me, that would be a great plan. We agree, which means we're giving up the search for the Nick Point. Instead, we'll refocus our search on the side of the Arroyo. But if we're going to find another bone bed, Dozer, Dan, and Jeff need to move some serious dirt and fast. Meanwhile, in the exposed bone bed, we're starting to see recognizable bones. It's a barefoot-only zone because bones exposed to the air are extremely fragile. Nice rib there, rib fragments up here, and a clump of who knows what yeah. over here. Uh, something for, for you and Casey to try to figure yeah. out. Just as we're hoping to see some projectile points or maybe another painted skull, Lee's assistant Casey makes another small but important find. Oh, tail. <gasps> oh, really? Yes, tail vertebra. Oh. And why do we want to know about tail vertebra? Well, if they took the hides and they took the hides elsewhere, the tails are generally attached to the hides. So if we oh. have those little caudal verts, then we can assume that potentially they didn't take the hides with them after they butchered the animal. Wow. Which is pretty cool. And that, it's not hard to believe that something that small came out of a buffalo. Yes, so that's in the part that goes down to the little fluffy bit. Yeah, their little tail yeah. thing. Yeah, the very, very last little bits of tail. See that little thing? This new piece of evidence tells us that our hunters killed enough that they could afford to be choosy with what they carried off. What we're doing here is trying to tease a story out of bones, to learn how these animals were killed, butchered, who did it, and using what weapons. But the story isn't just in the bones, it's also in the soil. So we go back in the time as we go down. Okay. These layers are, are identified by different colors, and the colors represent... Brian Carter used radiocarbon testing on different soil layers to give us the date of our kill. What's the date down there at that bottom nail? What age is that? We have generally dated this layer at about 1,000 years ago. How old is the soil down there by those bones? We have one age or two ages down at the bottom, uh, 10 to 11,000 years old. Brian is also testing this soil for pollen to see what plants were growing here at the time. But it's the date of the badger hole kill, which Brian pinpointed at 10,300 years old, that confirms this as one of the earliest mass bison kills ever found in North America. What remains a mystery is why our nomadic hunters chose this place for the big hunt. Just went oh. over the middle of the site. We're now beyond it. Yeah, we're, we're cutting back to the north now. And this, this area that if you look back down to your right, that's the Beaver River. OK. And so that's where we just went over okay. to where the site is. Down along this bluff is where Lee found several different bison killing fields. He only found them because the modern Beaver River eroded into the buried arroyos or gullies, exposing the bone beds. But with something called LIDAR, 
we can find even more hidden ancient arroyos that may have been part of this complex of killing fields. So this will be really interesting in the LiDAR data because I can see a little bit of the topography with my you know, eyes now, of course, but to look at that in 3D and manipulate it will be interesting. Lasers scan the ground surface, creating a map that renders trees and other distractions invisible. Subtle changes on the surface may be where old arroyos have filled in. With LiDAR, Meg spotted these. These new arroyos, in yellow, were invisible to the naked eye until today. But they could hold even more ancient bison bones. With the help of LiDAR, Lee may have stumbled onto a vast network of Paleo-Indian hunting grounds. What I really like about being over here with the radar team is, is we've got the Cooper site is right over there. This is Jake's Bluff that we're standing on. This. So their bones right under our feet. And they know that, their bones right are here. Too. They have an excavation that they've done and, and they've left a lot of the bones covered under, you know, under the earth so that we can potentially have it as a resource in the future. And, and, future and Badger Hole is just Just there. over there. The Badger Hole Arroyo is only the most recent of three bone-filled arroyos discovered in less than a mile. What it tells us is that hunters saw this landscape as a weapon. The abundance of dead-end arroyos provided a series of natural traps once hunters figured how to lure the bison in. So do you think that 10,000 years ago, this might have been like Bison Kill Central, arroyos Everywhere? Well, you know, there's great potential for that. I mean, in this small area, there are three confirmed sites. Just imagine when you expand on that, it's going to be a high concentration. Mapping the full extent of the Badger Hole bone bed is turning out to be a bigger chore than expected. Jeff's job is to keep an eye on the backhoe for signs of any bones that turn up. We only have a day and a half left, and we're still waiting. Fortunately, the skeletons in Lee's original bone bed are starting to reveal their secrets. These are parts that are still in place. Here is the pelvis and a hind leg coming out, so we have the thigh bone moving into the tibia, and we have ribs and part of the hump. That's the kneecap? That's the kneecap. The story that I'm piecing together is what you in have the right bone here. bit. Absolutely, yeah. there's lots of information here. And are you finding on any of these bones evidence of butchering here uh, at the site? So far, the only ones that have cut marks on them have been some of the ribs. Uh -huh like the, this rib coming across here, and then we have some ribs down over there. Uh, those are the only places that we're seeing any sort of butchering marks. Cut marks tell us that these bison didn't die here of natural causes. They were killed, then butchered in place. Lee mapped cut marks on a bison from Cooper site and used modeling to show that the paleo hunters targeted the choicest cuts of meat. But how were a small band of hunters able to kill so many huge animals in one place? Why couldn't a herd of massive bison escape people hunting on foot? Joe asked paleo-Indian expert Adrian Hannes to join him for a hike not far from Badger Hole. He and Adrian had an idea. They wanted Alan and I to help illustrate. This is an arroyo. And that's the nick point. That's the nick point. That's what we augured for. That's what we put down those 20-foot backhoe trenches for. That's what Lee is looking for. This is it. This is an arroyo. So we have our arroyo, which probably looks a lot like Badger Hole 10,000 years ago. Our question is, how did the Paleo Indians use it? Because these people had no horses, they were totally pedestrian, they were walking everywhere they went, and they, you know, so this is a, an entrapment, and it was an ingenious strategy. To give you a good idea of how this might have looked, I'm going to become a lead cow bison, 
and I happen to have a two-year-old bull over here behind me. <laughs> we are going uh, to are demonstrate <laughs> how this thing would have looked. If Joe and Alan are the bison, that means Adrian and I are the hunters. Based on what we saw at the bison preserve, Joe thinks paleo hunters spent days steering a small herd toward the mouth of the arroyo and then spooked them toward the nick point. They'll be bellowing. And here they come. And no! Ah! <laughs> and then attack, 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 attack. We did a pretty good job. We did. This was all in good fun. But we could see now how groups of hunters working together could trap the herd. What Lee found at the Cooper site adds one more piece of evidence. The position of the skeleton suggests that the lead bison tried to turn around at the nick point only to face a herd still pouring into the arroyo. Trapped in a dead end, the bison made easy targets. <laughs> Could you see us behind these bushes? No, no, if I'd be looking down, looking left and right to see which would be the least way out. And I turn around, there's the rest of the herd behind me. Absolutely, That's their behavior. It is, at least with a modern bison, and we're assuming that this would carry backwards in time to have a similar behavior. And, and the, the sites themselves demonstrate that this is what was happening. Later that afternoon, Lee showed us a fascinating piece of evidence that supported our portrayal of how the kill went down. This is a rib, and this whole impact here is from the projectile point slicing through. Uh -huh. And when you put this in the correct anatomical position, it shows us that on the point that came through, that it angled down just like this, glanced through that, and continued on in. There's actually a fragment of the projectile point edge embedded in, in the bone. So we see dramatic impact fractures, sometimes right here on the, on the, on the stone projectile point itself, and, and we see impact fractures on the bones. And it can yep. tell you the angle of the thrust of the spear from up above. So we're getting information about actually where, where, they, were on, where they were on, on the, the bluff, way. the angles they were using. Yeah. The position of the hunters right. mm -hmm. to the animals. The animals are in the gully, the hunters are up here. It's convincing evidence for how hunters on foot could safely mount their attack on the herd. But Lee's theory is that bands of Paleo Indians came from all over the region and worked together to pull off the hunt. He showed us projectile points he found that make his case. None of these are locally available mm -hmm. materials. Mm -hmm. And so the people bringing them and using these points had to get this material elsewhere and bring them here. We brought in a new piece of technology to test Lee's theory. XRF, or X-ray fluorescence, uses X-rays to read the mineral elements in stone points. Match the minerals to known Paleo-Indian quarry sites, and you've sourced the stone. It's a technology that does in minutes what used to take months. We have, um, say, an iron content of 163 parts per million, milligrams per kilogram. We have calcium at 198. Potassium at so this, is all this point is made of a rare flint called alabates, and there's only one place in the country where you can find it, and it's in Texas, 150 miles away. And the other points come from Kansas and distant parts of Oklahoma. For what we know about uh, the population levels 10,000 years ago in North America, there are small bands of people that are fairly mobile, and if we can demonstrate that these guys are coming together to make these kills, then that's a, a development that we don't normally think about when we're dealing with these early groups. Right, so we're starting to get social interaction, social organization. We're starting to figure out who are these people. Absolutely. Amazing, I love it. This is called flint napping. It comes from a, a German word. It just refers to using the conchoidal fracture of the stone to predictably chip it in the way that you want so that you end up with a sharp edge tool. We stopped by to see archaeologist Ian Thompson 
for a demonstration of how Folsom tools were made. In just 30 minutes, he took a block of chert and transformed it into a razor-sharp cutting blade. It's a skill that took Ian years to master. Deer antlers are a little softer. It doesn't have that same energy. It disperses a little bit when it hits it. So that gives you much more controlled flaking. Ian, can I feel that? Sure. Well, this is, this is really sharp. I was impressed with Ian's skill, but Adrian had an even bigger surprise in store for me. Back in the 80s, I had surgery performed. Um, and this is the ultimate. What wait, we're wait. Back in the 80s, you had surgery performed? With these blades. Are you kidding me? No, no, no. You no. let them go in there with those things? Right. Adrian was so convinced that stone tools were superior, he talked his own doctor into starting his colon surgery with handmade obsidian blades. So how does the sharpness of these obsidian tools compare with modern steel tools, if surgical you, tools? If you actually enlarge the edge of a surgical scalpel, brand new scalpel never used, looks like a rusty saw blade, and then under the same magnification you just have a straight line. So this is many, many, many times sharper. We should never diminish in any way at all the technology that these people carried with them because there are many examples of technologies from the past that are superior to our current technologies. Over the years, Lee found a variety of stone tools in with the bison bones, but the points he found all have a distinctive shape different from arrowheads or long spear points. They belong to a Paleolithic weapon called the atlatl. This is how atlatls were used. Well, it's our attempt at it, anyway. The atlatls used by Paleo-Indians 10,000 years ago were a big improvement over the simpler throwing spear because of this notched handle. Except it's like it, a launching thing. Correct, and yeah. it's an extension of your forearm. This monumentally increases the force, the velocity, okay. and the accuracy. So you place the tip of the spear in the, the end base, the base so you of the place spear. the base of the spear right in this notch in the notch of the so atlatl it's like a nick point we can overuse this term can't we <laughs> and then in other words and then what you're doing is just thrusting it whoa oh. gosh it just pierced that hay like the hide of a bison when did the atlatl get used well they probably originate in the old world and they're brought to the New World by people as they migrate into this hemisphere. The time depth of this is somewhat in debate, but it's probably at least 20 or 25,000 years ago. So this is the precursor to the bow and arrow. Correct. Clearly, the Paleo-Indians have us beat when it comes to hunting skills. But these atlatls were so effective that they were still in use by Western tribes when they encountered the Spanish nearly 10,000 years later. So we have the weapons and an idea of how the hunters attacked, but there's still a missing link. Since bison migrated and spent most of their time on the open plain where they'd be hard to kill, how did paleo hunters know when bison would come within range of these specific arroyo traps? And it's about two centimeters wide. One critical piece of evidence may hold a clue. This is a bison jaw. And if we can safely extract the teeth, tests could tell us what this animal ate and maybe where it grazed throughout the year. But removing it is a delicate operation. On the sides of the arroyo, we can be a little rougher. Dozer Dan is still working through the slump of topsoil in search of the sides of the Badger Hole Arroyo. We're already well into day two, so we're feeling the pressure. It's so exciting. But just shy of five o'clock, Jeff calls us in. Oh, I can't believe I wasn't here when you found it. 
Yeah, all right at the end of the day. Oh yeah. my gosh, I know. Always Perfect timing. That way. In the sidewall, uh -huh. the white. The white. Oh my yeah. gosh. And we have quite a few other bones with it. Oh. When the backhoe. I mean, brought after them out. all of this, you must have been just thinking, ugh. <laughs> all day. <laughs> but uh, Dozer Dan has a good eye. And, and so do you, it. Jeff. That's oh. awesome. The bones are in soil that's sloughed away at the mouth of the arroyo over the centuries, so they're in a bit of a jumble. But at least we now have a better idea of how wide the arroyo was 10,300 years ago. And finding more bones only adds to the evidence that this was one very big bison kill. But with only one day left, we have to kick our work into high gear in order to tell the story of what happened here. It's the start of our third and final day of digging. We've exposed enough bones now to determine that they're from cows, calves, and young bulls, typical of herds in later summer when larger bulls are finished the rut. But there's even more to be read into these bones. Uh, Lee's schooling me here. You know how the, the bones in our skull fuse at different times in our life? We can tell the age of bison by at, you know, what point the toe bones are fused. Check this out. This so is inside cool. the hoof? Yeah. The hoof would be laying right here. These are the, uh, the phalanges. Let me see your hand for just a second. I'll give you an example. This would be the hoof. This is this bone. This would be these two. And then you'd have your, your metacarpal. That's what this is. Mm -hmm. And in a bison, this one fuses at one year of age, this one at two years of age, this one at three years of age. So depending on which ones are fused and which ones aren't fused, we can tell if it's a one, two, or three-year-old. How old is it? This one, it's at least three years of age. This one's fused, so it's more than one. This one's fused, it's more than two. And this is fused, so it's more than three. It's about 11 in the morning when we get word that our most exciting bit of evidence is ready to come out. There's probably nothing here that can tell us as much as this jawbone. These teeth are, have all of the information for aging this animal, so to know if it's a calf, yearling, something like that. And then also, it contains the teeth that we need to figure out where this animal spent a year of its life. We're feeling a bit like crime scene investigators now, because tests on this jaw could reveal vivid details about the environment this bison lived in up until the moment it died. Turn it around the other way, please. Yes. A little more. There okay. You go. Got him. And there you Beautiful. go. There you go. Beautiful. <laughs> Good job, Paul. Yeah. Now you All get to right. dump him in the bag. We've been gathering evidence for three days now and piecing it together with what Lee's learned from his other bison kills. It's time to head to Lee's science war room to see how our story is coming along. Our storyline has been that we have um, these Folsom hunters coming up here, running a fair number of bison into these dead-end arroyos mm -hmm. and making these kills. For this to be successful, we have to have a couple of things happen. One, we have to have the hunters, we have to have arroyos, and most importantly, we have to have bison. From the bones, we now know that the bison Lee found were a supersized bison called Bison Antiquus. They were the survivors after the mammoths, camels, and horses of the Clovis period died off. What killed those other great beasts is still in debate among scientists. But what we know is that by the Folsom period, bison had almost no competition on the prairie. We know this because Lee tracked changes in the amount and type of pollen in the ancient soil. The highlighted area here means that we are getting an explosion of, of grasses. Grasses, okay, and that's exactly when the bison were flourishing, right? Correct. Bison had prime grazing around Badger Hole 10,000 years ago. 
but bison migrate. So how did the hunters know when bison would be in the area? That answer lies in the bison teeth, which were sent off for a specialized test called laser ablation. We look at the enamel in the teeth and the trace elements in that enamel will allow us to put those bison on the landscape. And that as they move from one spot, say up here in northeastern Oklahoma, one of the key elements in that region is lead. Lead. Okay. And so if we find in the, a particular part of the enamel a high incidence of lead, then that would suggest that that animal at some time had been eating up here. Okay. And so we will be able to map that bison as it moves across the landscape for that one year. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. So finding teeth is like finding gold. Oh, absolutely. Wow. Just think what a gold tooth would do for us. <laughs> but we'll go with this. Results from one tooth read like a page from a bison diary 10,300 years ago. That is incredible. The bison then wintered in East Kansas. That's right. From the enamel, they know where the bison wintered. Yep. That's amazing. Our badger hole animal 10,300 years ago uh, wintered right over here. And, and in the spring, moved to somewhere over here and then came back in the summertime and making this sort of a migration, the hunters came up and killed him right there. We now have everything we need to tell for the first time what happened here at Badger Hole. It's late August or early September, 10,300 years ago. The nip of autumn brings hunters together from as far away as Kansas and Texas. The hunters know this is when migrating bison linger near small arroyos, including Badger Hole and when the dangerous bulls finished with mating would be away from the herd. On the open plain, small groups of hunters watch, then target a mother cow and a dozen or so followers. Over several days, the hunters slowly cut this group off and edge it towards Badger Hole. One group of hunters spooks the lead cow into the arroyo and the herd follows. Bison race up the arroyo, but face a dead end. The animals try to turn back, but atlatl spears rain down from other hunters who staked out the high ground. Dozens of bison are killed, enough to feed hundreds. Our dig and our story is almost complete, but there's one more thing we need to do. It's time to put theory into practice. Lee has an idea about exactly how the animals were butchered and how much of the animals were actually put to use. To test his idea, we're going to butcher a real bison. This isn't something we took lightly, and we asked for guidance from the Cheyenne Arapaho tribes of Oklahoma. They raise bison for food, and they gave us an animal that they had already planned to butcher. They welcomed the chance to join Lee, his students, and time team in recreating how Paleo Indians butchered bison using nothing but stone tools. Like in our kill there at Badger Hole, we will have a skeleton that's laid over on its side. It's splayed like this, so we know that that's the position it was in when it was butchered. What you do is we'll cut into the hide, and we will cut it along, going down the back. So are these the same types of tools you guys have found on these sites? This is exactly the type of tool we're finding, exactly the shape. See how that just cuts right through that hide? Look at the fat on that. Yeah, wow. How many people would be butchering these things? Everybody in the group probably was involved in the butchering. Yeah. Any gender divisions in this type of labor, or is everybody just kind of doing what needs to be done? 10,000 years ago, what we have left are bison bones <laughs> and lithic material, and they don't come in pink and blue. <laughs> OK. Three out of four people butchering right now are? Women. <laughs> <laughs> we have our answer. <laughs> the work has to go quickly so the meat won't spoil. 
Moving fast means our team often nicks the bones as the meat is being cut, something Lee saw on the bison at Badger Hole as well. Those cut marks are part of why Lee thinks Paleo-Indians didn't butcher the entire animal and didn't use every part of the animal, but rather targeted only the best cuts of meat. Lee, there's no uh, cut marks on the legs usually or anything like that? No, Just... it's all going to be on what you can reach from here. Wow. What was this like for you guys? Our, our people did this and it's just like natural for us. Uh-huh. Like when we're born, we're natural born warriors. You know? Yeah. Unlike the Paleo Indians, we'll leave nothing behind. The bones, hide and skull will be studied by Lee's students, and much of the meat will go back to the Cheyenne Arapaho tribes. We have our elder program. We donate buffalo meat to the elder program. We distribute out to our elders. Great. 55 and over. Uh -huh. We take care of our elders. Fortunately for us, there's enough left over to share with everyone who took part in our three days at Badger Hole. And it was in this moment that our story really came together. While our story has largely been about the death of a great herd of bison, for Paleo-Indians, a feast like this would be cause for celebration. After three days of digging, did we get what we came for? Did we learn something new about these ancient people? and the world they lived in. We saw reconstructed climate, reconstructed environment. After that, you get insight into the people, which is what this is all really about. From the air and from the ground doing 3D scanning, we can actually look at the broader context of what was going on in the landscape and begin to identify areas for future investigations. We can source these projectile points to very different regions on the landscape, hundreds of miles apart. And it really reinforces the possibility that people were coming from far and wide to cooperatively hunt. These hunters knew the bison, knew the landscape, knew actually how to use the landscape as a weapon. They were experts at what they did. They really were. I mean, this is just wonderful. The Paleo-Indians, how they looked, how they lived, are in many ways still a big mystery to archaeologists. But after three days, Time Team got one step closer to unlocking the survival secrets of some of North America's first people. Next time on Time Team America, Lost Civil War Prison. Now this one is actually charred on the end. This is really exciting, isn't it? Are you I'm seriously the saying energy? we should excavate in the parking yes, lot? Yes, I am. Oh, sweet! What is wow. This? this is an insignia. Wow. Oh, gosh. These are prisoners of war, and this picture frame, this is home. This represents right, home. That's, that's it. The wall, isn't that's it? That's it. That's the prison wall. This program was made possible in part by... A major grant from the National Science Foundation, where discoveries begin. Learn more on the web at pbs.org slash timeteamamerica, where you'll find an in-depth look at the science and technologies we use, web-exclusive videos of the team, and highlights from our archaeology field school for you. This season of Time Team America is available on DVD. To order, visit shoppbs.org or call us at 1-800-PLAY-PBS.